break it down a little bit, not quite day by day, but if you can give us an idea of what life is like when you're getting a type rating in an Eclipse 500. Absolutely. To begin with, uh, it's kind of hard, cold reality when you walk in the door. After there's a brief orientation, there's going to be an 80, uh, 80 question test to determine whether or not you have studied and memorized the limitations of the aircraft and the memory items for the aircraft. If you don't pass that 80, 80 question test, then that's the end of your type training because all of the information is presented to people to study with beforehand uh, with a detailed study guide of how to prepare uh, for that when they get here. Uh, we've had very good results with that. We've had nobody that hasn't passed that test, but that's a pretty good indicator that people are going to have the information that they're going to need for the oral portion of the check ride. At that portion, uh, at that point, there will be a two-day review of systems and other uh, instrument procedures that just to verify that the fundamentals that are necessary uh, before they go into type training are in place. Then before the actual motion simulator events occur, there are several cockpit procedure training sessions where they'll be in, conducted in the level D simulators or the flight training devices, but it's really more about learning the panel, learning the AVIO systems, one, one session devoted strictly to the primary flight display, one to the multifunction display, another for emergency procedures, and that really forms the basis of uh, the backbone uh, to then go in and begin operating the aircraft and operating the systems in flight. Are there any areas that are popping up as being particularly problematical? Absolutely, and it's called basic instrument skills. Mm -hmm. And because of the, 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 the nature of that problem, uh, we really need to try and address it beforehand rather than after. It's one of the things that makes the flight skills assessment so important to us to identify whether or not they have a scan. Because let's remember, there's a lot of people that may be m moving from steam gauges to flat panel EFIS equipment for the first time. And if uh, in their real life they're uh, taking off and turning on the autopilot, their scans probably deteriorated. And so we have to bring them up to a common standard in order to be successful in training. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system. With its detailed design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at cirrusdesign.com. There's a couple of different elements that we've added to the basic type training that most people are familiar with before people even begin their type training for the Eclipse 500. One of those is the flight skills assessment where they'll come and work with us in a flight training device and go through a simple profile to make sure that their instrument proficiency and knowledge is up to the point that it needs to be to enter entertain the, uh, the type training. Normally that's done in conjunction with their emergency situation training, which for us comprises two flights in the L-39 going through mm -hmm. emergency recovery or upset recovery training, and then a hypoxia training in aviation physiology. We try and do that FSA, flight skills assessment, far enough in advance so that if the customer is having some difficulty, we can identify a corrective actions or additional training that they might be able to take with us in their aircraft if they've taken delivery, or they can come back and work with us in the non-motion flight training devices. Um, after that, they'll come for type training, and to enter that, they've got to have at least a private multi-engine and instrument rating. And uh, that is a 12 to 13 day course, two days of ground school, and then simulator sessions. And it's all pretty rigorous. It's, uh, it's not made to be an easy course. It's quite demanding. But then again, the standards that Eclipse has made for our customers and the pilots of our aircraft have always been a little bit higher than, uh, than the average. For the person who may not be that jet conversant, or for that matter, may have let their skills lapse a little bit and qu can't quite make the cut on the FSA the first time around, what kind of counseling or re remedial training might you offer to, to get them up to snuff? 
Well, there's two things that you mentioned there. One is the jet transition and the other is the instrument proficiency. It's surprising how little difficulty we're seeing with the jet transition. Mm -hmm. This airplane is typically operated at 150 to 180 knots in a terminal environment and then slowing down to approach speeds in the order of uh, 95 uh, knots or so on approach. So that is actually simpler. But the instrument procedures for people that have been using autopilots extensively and enhanced flight management systems which the simulators that we have at this time do not incorporate that can be a little bit more challenging and so a couple of things that we can offer them we can do pre-training in their own aircraft pre-training in a leaseback aircraft or we can work with them in the flight training devices that we have available staffed with Eclipse instructors and then at the completion of that they will retake the flight skills assessment or if they're working with us in the simulator we'll know based on their performance how, they, how they're going to do but they do have to successfully pass that flight skills assessment before they'll be allowed to enter type training. You've heard of this thing called WAS, right? The Wide Area Augmentation System lets you fly GPS glide path approaches without relying on ground-based landing aids. No VOR, no ILS, no problem. Fact is, WAS is so smart, it even knows what you're going to say next time you need it. And don't have it on board. Wah! Wah! I want my WAS now! I was really crying there for a second. What kind of support can you give the new jet pilot in making sure that not only have they made the transition, but the early days where everything is still kind of new and judgment is one of those things where you've got to think twice about? How do you bring those people into the real world and give them some sense of confidence? Well, if we were relying only on the FAA regulations, then that would be the end of it. They would actually get that ticket, be able to go out into their airplane for the first time on their own. But fortunately, uh, Eclipse has found a novel mechanism to work with. In our aircraft flight manual, we have a limitation regarding pilot training, which requires all pilots flying the Eclipse 500 to go through a complete training program, which incorporates the flight skills assessment and emergency situation training that we talked about earlier, but also, on the other end, incorporates mentoring and recurrent training. Recurrent training is familiar to most jet pilots, but that's because most jets require two crew. And recurrent training, as it turns out, is only required for two crew aircraft. So you could, per the regulations, get your type rating in the Eclipse 500 and never return to training again. We didn't think that was such a good idea, so we wrote into the overall training program that recurrent training is required at one-year intervals. Mm -hmm. As far as the mentoring, the mentoring really emulates the initial operating experience that airlines use because we're trying to go after the safety record that the airlines Part 121 carriers have. And that training, as opposed to type training, which is really about complying with practical test standards for the airline transport pilot checkride, is about how to operate your airplane in the real world. As an example, on a checkride, you're probably going to slow down to ref plus 10 at the outer marker. That can be as slow as 94 knots, which would certainly gum up the system if we were to operate in the real world that way. A pilot might want to do that if it's really 200 and a half at an uncontrolled field, but if they're flying in mixing with the big boys at O'Hare, they're going to need to scoot along quite a bit faster. Learning how to operate the airplane in the real world with faster approach speeds would be just one of the areas that we would approach with mentoring. Others would include going into mountain airports, going into shorter field airports. For guys with an airline background, it can mean going into uncontrolled fields. There's a whole different area of... Uh, orientation that's required for high time heavy jet pilots when they're coming down to a less than 6,000 pound airplane that we have in the Eclipse 500. And finally, what are you hearing from people who have been through this process and now have had some time in the system? Are they coming back with you with any information that's been helpful to you in the constant evolution of a program of this nature? Yes, we're really transitioning from phase one of our training, which was to set it up and get it into operation, now into phase two, which is gathering that information and trying to fold it back into the system. In large part, the comments are that it was the toughest training that they've been through in their flying career, but that they really enjoyed it, especially the mentoring portion. And so we've gotten pretty high marks with the instructor staff, certainly with the equipment that we're using. It's now a matter of fine-tuning some of the scheduling and uh, technical information, syllabus information that's provided to make the whole process a little bit smoother and easier for individuals that come to train with us.